Okay, this example, uh, we want to find the magnetic field due to a thick wire that has a current I going through it. So the, the current is uniformly distributed uh, along the radius, the, the, the cross-section of the wire. The current density is uniform, J, and we want the magnetic field for any point outside and any point inside. So first we'll just re require what the magnetic field is for any point outside, then we'll do the other case later. So to start using uh, Ampere's law, we need to know what the direction of the magnetic field is. If you look at the wire from a head-on point of view, so that here the current is coming out of the page, and I just put as if this wire consists of small, th very thin wires that are all packed next to each other. Of course, it's continuous, but I'm just trying to put it in a kind of intuitive way that it con it's consisting of small, uh, thin wires that are closely spaced. Of course, I left space between them just so you can see what's going on, but this should be completely filled with thin wires. Then you'll have infinite number of thin wires in that case. So this is just for illustra illustration. What would the direction of the magnetic field be at this point due to this wire that has uniform current everywhere inside it? If you imagine taking one of those thin wires, infinite wires, like this one, the magnetic field, if you find the direction ds out of the page and r hat is going this way, so ds cross r hat, is it will be perpendicular to this line going that way. Take another element of thin wire exactly opposite to the, other, to the first one, it will make a magnetic field this way. Add the two, the magnetic field due to these two thin wires, then you, the components in this direction add and the components in this direction cancel. So from the symmetry, you're always going to have a thin wire here and one opposite to it here from symmetry. No matter what happens, everything is symmetric about this axis. So that means that the total magnetic field will be pointing upwards here. The same argument for any point and you can show that the magnetic field lines go around in circles, exactly the same way they do around a thin wire. So why is that important? Because when we apply Ampere's law, first thing we need to do is to choose an Amperian loop. So we need to choose the shape of the Amperian loop, and we need to know where to put it. And also what direction of ds should we use for the Amperian loop. We're going to take an Amperian loop in the shape of a circle, and the reason is because of the direction of the magnetic field. We proved just a while ago that the magnetic field lines go around in circles. And so that means, that get, makes us choose this uh, Amperian loop, which is a circle, because remember, when you want to derive the magnetic field in an equation like this, the same way we did for Gauss's law, the first step you need to do is to get rid of the dot product. And to get rid of the dot product, you'd better make B and DS in the same direction because then you can replace b dot ds by b ds. You can get rid of the dot product. So when you take uh, the, the Amperian loop to be a circle and the, the elements of length ds go around in a circle this way, the dot product between b and ds will just become b ds. The cosine zero becomes one. So that's the reason we choose this Amperian loop. And we choose the ds vectors to go around this way because remember, if you put your fingers around the direction of the, around the vectors ds, in the direction of ds, then the thumb will point in the positive sense of the current. And if you do that, the positive sense of the current will be pointing in the direction of the real current in the circuit. So integration of b dot ds will be a positive number. And so that also helps us when we solve the problem. So first thing, what's the angle between B and DS for every element of length on this Amperian loop? We just showed the answer to that a while ago. It turns out that B is in the same direction as DS for every single element of length. So B dot DS becomes B DS. The second thing is from symmetry, we don't know yet what the value of B is here. We don't know what the value of B is anywhere on the circle, but we know from symmetry that if you get B here, it should be the same exactly as B here, exactly the same as B here from symmetry. If you go around the circle, everything looks the same. So the, the value of the magnetic field should be the same. So I can, I don't know what B is, but I know that it's constant. It's the same value everywhere. So I can take it outside the integration. 
And so what's left then is integration of ds. Integration of ds means you're adding this length plus this length plus this length plus this length. You're adding all these lengths. When you add all these vectors, the lengths of them, you get what? You get the circumference of the circle, which is 2 pi r. So the left-hand side of Gauss's law, of Ampere's law, is b times 2 pi r. Okay, what about the right-hand side of Ampere's law? It should be mu node, which is a constant, times the current enclosed. So we need to look at this Amperian loop and see how much current is going through the loop. And of course, you can see directly that all the current is going inside the loop because by definition, we chose a point outside of the cylinder, the, cil the wire, cylindrical wire. So that means when you, when you go around the loop, the circle, all the current is enclosed inside the circle. And so the right-hand side will simply be and so we get a simple relationship then we can get then the magnetic field is equal to mu node i over 2 pi r and it turns out to be exactly the same magnetic field as we got before for a thin wire remember we derived the magnetic field we found the magnetic field due to a thin wire using bios of our law and we got mu node i over 2 pi r well it's the same result right but now we got the derivation for a thick wire so this is a more complicated problem than the case of a thin wire so this is what the magnetic field is for R bigger than R. What would the case be if you want to get the magnetic field at a point inside the cylinder, like this point here, for instance? What shape Amperian loop would you choose and where would you put it? The same idea, I would take a circle that's also coaxial with the cylinder and I would choose the ds vectors to go around this way because the current, positive sense of the current will be this way in the direction of which the current is actually. And from symmetry, uh, again, you can show that the magnetic field lines will be going around in circles. And so the angle between B and DS will be zero. And so that's why we chose to take a circle for the Amperian loop. So B dot DS becomes B DS. And the same principle exactly that B is constant everywhere on the circle, even though we don't know what the value is, but it's constant. So you can take it outside the integration. You get B integration of DS, which is B times 2 pi R. So the left-hand side of Ampere's law is exactly the same as we got before. It's not different. Now, the, the, the important thing now to find out what is, current, what is the current enclosed. If you look at this yellow circle or this um, pale circle here with radius r, the one that's enclosed, the one that's going, uh, the, the loop is enclosing. Uh, what is the total current enclosed in this circle? It's not definitely the total current i because there's part of the current that's not going through that circle. Here, for instance, the current is going through, there's some current here, but it's not going through the circle. So how could you find exactly how much current is going through this circle only? Well, we know the current going through any surface is integration of j dot, j dot dA. And since in this problem, j is in the same direction as dA, so you just get integration of j dA. In this problem, they gave you that j was constant. The current density was uniform. It was uniform, it was constant everywhere. So we can take the j side of the integration. So you get into j integration of dA. What's integration of dA for this area? It's just the area. And what's the area of this circle? It's times small r squared. So that's what the current enclosed is. But how can we write j in a more convenient way in terms of the total current? Well, if you look at the, the whole wire, how much current is going through the whole wire? It's I. And what's the area of the whole wire? It's pi times big R squared. So J, actually, we can get it independently, saying that J is the total current, but going through which area? The total area, pi big R squared. So that's what J is. We can then substitute the value of J here, and then a nice ratio where we can cancel out the pi and we get a ratio of the radius of the small circle to the radius of the big circle, all squared. So this is then the current enclosed inside the circle. It's the ratio of the square of the radii times the current or the total current. And so we can substitute then I enclosed here to be R squared over big R squared times the current. And now we're ready then to find the magnetic field because one of these r's will cancel with one of these r's and you get only a small r on the right hand side and this will be the final answer you get mu naught i over r squared 2 pi times r
So that means that the, the magnetic field increases linearly as you go from the center, the value is zero. If, as you go outwards, it li increases linearly until you get to the surface. So this is what the magnetic field looks like when you go from zero to the radius big R. This is a visual picture of what the magnetic field looks like from zero to infinity. From zero to big R, it's linear, it increases linearly. As you go outside from big R to infinity, it decreases as one over R and it goes to zero at infinity.